Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the next session of our ICP Tips and Tricks webinar series. Today, we will hear from three presenters with each presentation lasting approximately 15 minutes, and we will have a 15-minute question and answer segment at the end. You can ask questions at any point via the chat window, and any questions we don't get a chance to address live will be answered and made available with the on-demand recording. Just a reminder, some portions of this webinar have been pre-recorded. Computer audio is only available for these recordings and is the recommended option for attending this webinar. In addition, supplemental information is available for download from the handout section of the control panel. Lastly, at the close of the webinar, there will be a very short survey, just one question. Please take the time to respond as it will help us determine which topics to discuss in the future. Just a quick note on how to access the handouts. The handouts are available via the GoToWebinar control panel. Simply click the drop down arrow of the handouts frame and then click the name of each handout to begin downloading. With that out of the way, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers for today's webinar. We'll first hear from Bob Lockerman, Global Product Manager for CEM Corporation. Bob graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a Bachelor of Science degree in analytical chemistry. Upon graduation, he worked as a bench chemist for a commercial testing lab in Massachusetts. After three years, he joined the team at CEM to develop the world's first microwave digestion system and supported these systems and applications in the field before becoming the global product manager for the analytical division. Bob will cover tips for inorganic dissolution, including acid selection and multi-step approaches in addition to grinding to increase surface area. Following Bob's presentation, we will hear from Ryan Brennan, president of Glass Expansion Incorporated. Before taking on the role of president, Ryan was the product and marketing manager for Glass Expansion. Prior to joining Glass Expansion, Ryan worked at the National Institute of Standards and Technology as an NRC postdoctoral research associate. Ryan received his doctorate in analytical chemistry from George Washington University. Ryan will introduce sample introduction components geared towards high total dissolved solids, high acid content, and hydrofluoric acid. Accessories that help to prevent salt buildup and improve long-term stability, including a high-performance and inert sample introduction system for ICP, will be highlighted. Lastly, we will hear from Stan Smith, Field Application Scientist Manager for Atomic Spectroscopy at Perkin Elmer. Stan has been with Perkin Elmer for 11 years, most of that time as a field application scientist. Stan has 25 years of experience in the environmental and lubricant fields and another 11 years with Perkin Elmer's Atomic Spectroscopy Group. He has held several positions in laboratory operations, quality assurance, technical development, environmental health and safety, and laboratory management with several major analytical laboratories. With Perkin Elmer, Stan spends most of his time working on applications and method development for inorganic spectroscopic techniques for a wide variety of industries. Stan will discuss how to obtain accurate results with good precision over longer time intervals with fusion samples using the Avio 500 ICP OES. Now, without further delay, let's hear from Bob. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank the audience for joining us today on behalf of CEM Corporation. My name is Bob Lockerman, and I am the Analytical Product Manager for CEM Corporation. And today I'm going to focus on microbe digestion of inorganic sample matrices. I guess we should define what is an inorganic sample matrix and what we consider. And those would be things like soils, oil ores, excuse me, ceramics, catalyst materials, metals and metal alloys, all sorts of oxides, ash from an organic maybe prep, and then water, of course. Pretty much anything that doesn't have a carbon base. And they're digested much differently than, inor than organic samples, which we'll cover in a future lecture. What do we want to consider when we're going to be doing inorganic uh, sample prep? And this is really important because we have to consider what acids, because certain acids will take in certain things or combinations. We have to worry about the sample matrix because what, what's in the sample to digest it. The analytes of interest, and that makes sure that we're digesting something, we don't complex it into something else. Um, the temperatures required, and some inorganics will digest at 210, like metals and alloys, and some oxides and ceramics need to go to 270 or greater. So higher temperature digest typically than organics, but as you'll see, much lower in pressure, which is nice. It also might require a stepwise approach. So we'll use two different acid mixtures, and I'm going to show an example of that with mullite. 
And then we will notice that the internal pressure, as I'll show you on these graphs, are much lower than organic sample digestions, so we don't have to worry about exothermic reactions for these types of samples, which is nice. Let's look at the various acids that we have at our disposal and where we use them. It's unusual to use nitric acid alone for an inorganic digestion. Uh, it's a good oxidizing agent, which means it's fantastic for organics. But typically for inorganics, we're going to use it in combination with something like HCl and make aqua regia a reverse, or maybe just or HCl and, and, and HF, and we're going to cover that a little bit further on. Uh, it's compatible with most analytical techniques, which means it's friendly to the instrumentation, uh, as, as friendly as an acid could be. And you could obtain nitric acid in high purity. And then the one thing you have to really worry about is that it can passivate. And if you passivate so aluminum, chromium, titanium, for instance, it's almost impossible then to get to the next step. It's, it's, you'll have, pretty much have to start again. Hydrofluoric, actually hydrochloric is considered a good complexing agent. And it forms soluble complexes with many types of metal ions and keeps them in solution. It's not an oxidizing agent, so if there are any carbon material, you may require nitric, and sometimes HC, uh, excuse me, it may require nitric to, to form uh, aqua regia, and aqua regia is very uh, good for many different types of metals, and we'll discuss that as we move forward. It's very useful for things like iron and aluminum and indium and, and antimony and tin, and it'll stabilize many elements in small quantities. If you don't have HCl and you were not analyzing uh, right, right away, some elements may drop out of solution. Uh, one, in, one note is that the chloride complexes may interfere with both graphite furnace and then also form uh, compounds that would uh, give you false readings on your ice beam mass spec. And uh, that's for another day lecture. Hydrofluoric acid, the, one acid, the acid that most people do not like to work with, but unfortunately if you're going to digest silicates, you're going to need hydrofluoric acid. Uh, fluoride is a very powerful complexing ion and therefore it will strip away the bonds and, and allow the silicon to be digested. It does volatilize silicon as silicon te uh, tetrafluoride. In some instances, that makes it very difficult to analyze for silicon. Uh, it does form insoluble fluorides uh, with, the, with the group 2A and the rare earth elements quite frequently. If so, then we can complex it with boric acid at the end to, uh, to take, take those in solution. And the safety hazard, of course, uh, specialized training of your lab staff when you're doing HF and uh, the PPE, appropriate PPE, is a must. And uh, the guys from Glass Expansion would tell you it will require uh, HF resistant transport system uh, for the analyzer, uh, special stuff. The acid mixtures. Okay, I guess we went through acids, but what about mixtures? And that's really very common for these types of samples. So the, one of the most common ones is for doing, uh, for precious metals, is to do it in aqua regia, which is three to one uh, of the mixture of nitric and HCl. Uh, we also do reverse aqua regia. And then nitric HCl and HF, sometimes you need that to get your alloys, especially alloys that would incorporate some silicates. Um, and then ores, definitely, and ash. Um, aluminum oxide requires a very high temperature digestion, and we achieve that by using sulfuric and phosphoric acids together. And there's been some work with aluminum oxides that have done in pure HCl if you can get to high enough temperatures. Uh, but typically, the sulfuric phosphoric is the more traditional. Um, and then acid X and acid Y. Uh, and water. And sometimes it's great to have the water in the mix because you do the digestion and the water is there to solubilize. And so there's a lot of different ways to look at things and we'll go in later in more in detail as to what we can do for you and then later on even show you some resources that will help you decide which acid mixture to use. Inorganic samples that are digested in a batch system like the Mars uh, in this system here, we'd recommend using the I-Wave temperature measurement and that's just a contactless uh, temperature measurement that, that actually measures inside of the vessel into your um, liquid, so your acid sample combination. And that means that you don't have any probes to connect and nothing to worry about leaking where the thermoil attaches in. It makes it very simple. And then you have vessel choices. There are some easier to digest metals and alloys. That will, that will show you an example of one that will digest at 180 degrees, uh, but uh, the only which will work fine in a Mars Express or a Mars Express Plus. But the only problem is, is that you don't want to use too much HF. If you do, you want to be cognizant of the fact that the uh, vent and reseal vessel of the, um, of the express vessel will allow some HF fumes to get out. 99% are going to get pulled straight out by the exhaust system, but you want to be careful going in afterwards when grabbing your vessels and then wipe down the cavity very good at the end of the, at the, end of the run to make sure that you don't have any uh, HF uh, available to, uh, to touch. Um, all other applications, we recommend using either the Easy Prep Plus which is the vessel here at the bottom and left uh, next to the Mars, or the IPREP vessel, which is a newer vessel that CEM introduced a couple of years ago that goes to very high pressures, typically used for, inorga for organics, excuse me, but can be used for inorganics as well. 
these are the kind of guidelines that we say when you're ramping. Now, we rec always recommend using one-touch methods, and those are our pre-programmed methods. But if there's not one appropriate, then in Easy Prep Plus, we recommend a ramp time of 10 to 15 minutes, and then a hold time of 10 minutes, and then that temperature's up to 300. Now, because the iPrep can go to such high pressures on the organic side, we limit you to the fact you can either program between a 25 to a 30 minute ramp, um, which is a longer ramp, but, uh, and then a 10 minute, same 10 minute hold, and again, up to 300 degrees C. Let's look at some examples then for some inorganic digestions. And what we're gonna look at pretty much is a metal alloy, and then alumina in the alpha form, which is its most stable form, more difficult to digest, and then mullite, and we'll discuss what mullite is, and that requires the two-step digestion I had spoken of. Metal alloys. Uh, again, we look at the you know, different mixtures for different metal alloys. Um, we have a, um, HC, again, 3 to 1 HCl nitric for precious metals. That's our aqua regia again. We have our nitric and HF for things like nichrome steel, and then cobalt, tantalum, and uh, tungsten alloys. And then an HCl-HF mixture actually works well with aluminum and, and, and iron alloys, and then we have the old the generic one saying that not every, these three have taken a lot, but you may actually have to adjust it. And that's kind of what we're here for. The, our, our, our application staff are here to help you get your samples in solution, so to speak. One key thing, that surface area is important. Grind them down. Get them, get them very small particulates. It really, really helps. Um, uh, and, and the correct acid mixture is really the key. So here's the program that we ran on the Mars 6 with a half a gram of the uh, nickel cobalt alloy and it was 15 mils of a one to one, so five nitric, five HF and five water. And uh, this is one where that, uh, with, you, did, you could do the express vessel because the temperature's low. We're just doing a 10 minute ramp and a 10 minute hold to 180. But again, be, be aware of the, the HF vapors that could be around. This is the graph and the red line is the temperature line. You can see there's the 180 being held there very nicely. But look how low the pressure is. We're just bounding between 80 and 90 PSI. Uh, when you attend the, the organic portion of this uh, of a future uh, webinar, you're going to notice that it's much, much higher than that. Now let's look at alpha alumina. Again, that's a very stable form and typically is run, as I mentioned before, in a combination of sulfuric, phosphoric. Um, again, this sample really needs to be well ground. If there's a chunk in there, the surface area is such that it, it just may never digest. And to, to completely digest it, 250 minimum in some forms actually will require 270 and above. So again, this is the, we did six and a half mils of phosphoric to three and a half mils of sulfuric. That's a very high temperature acid combination, so to speak. And we go uh, 10 minute ramp with a 15 minute hold. And this one was a temperature of 250 degrees C. And again, that's what the graph looks like here. The red is the temperature line, uh, which we're sitting up there at 250 C. The green line is our, represents our, the power, which basically how much power they're inputting to the system. And then that blue line, which is sitting down there really low, below 50 PSI this time, is the uh, pressure line. So the nice thing is, is we're at really high temperatures, but since we're at such low pressures, we're really not stressing the vessel. So if you're at high pressures and high temperatures, that's when you worry about stressing the vessel and getting very few vessel runs and things like that. But again, the low pressure really, really helps here. Now, final one, uh, mullite, which is a really interesting material. It's a combination of an aluminum and silicate oxide. So you've got two refractory materials. You've got aluminum and silicon, and they call it an, a refractory aluminum silicate clay is what it's referred to. So you have to do a two-step method. You have to take the aluminum part in with the phosphoric sulfuric that we just showed, and then come back at it and actually do that digestion, cool it, and then come back and add HF for the, for the silicon dioxide. We, of course, tried it in a one-pot method. Everyone would try that first, add both acids, and what you get is mud. <laughs> it just never comes clear. So, once again, particle size is important. Grind it down to a powder. We just did a tenth of a gram for this sample uh, for what we were doing for this study. And here's our method program one. So we took our material. We added 10 mils of phosphoric acid to it this time. Um, and then we just basically ramped it for 10 minutes with a 15-minute hold. And the temperature's not high here. It's, it's, it's only 200 degrees C, so it's not the, the fact that it's a, a high temperature application, but this, again, is going after the aluminum portion. And again, that's the, the, uh, the temperature profile with the 10 mils of the phosphoric acid, and, and basically the, the sample would be in the tenth of a gram, as we mentioned. The temperature is sitting right up there at 200, and the pressure, again, is fairly low. We then have to cool it. We bring it down below 80 degrees, and then we can open the vessel. Uh, and uh, basically add the HF very, very slowly and carefully, and we drop it down in, uh, we put it in drop-wise, 
And then we seal the vessel back up and we put them back in the microwave and we do a 10 minute ramp and a 15 minute hold. And of course, this would be for an easy prep. The iPrep vessel, because of limitations, uh, it'll make you do a 25 minute ramp. That's just for safety. Um, and there's our program for number two. Pretty similar, a little higher in pressure, but not much. It's a, uh, but basically and that's just because the vapor pressure of the HF is such, it's a lower boiling point. So you, you gain a little bit of a of pressure there. So again, there's your curve, there's your, the, the digest. And Voila, and I apologize, it's not the greatest of pictures, but the left is the molite before. At the bottom, that's just a stir bar we've been using. So that white thing's a stir bar. Uh, we need to get a better stock photo of that. But uh, in any event, uh, that it's, it's a completely clear dissolution. And if you did try to do a, a one-pot method, it would look just like it did to begin with in, in the, on the left-hand side. This is key. Where do I go for help? Uh, the CRC, obviously, is the chemist's best friend. It's, uh, it's got a lot of information in there, which is really good. Uh, there's some microwave enhanced chemistry book that has an extension of inorganics. Uh, Kingston and Haswell, the editors, it's been out in print for about 20 years. Um, there's a book that's no longer in print, but we're willing to loan you pages of it. Uh, it's the Rudolf Bach book. It goes back 100 years. It's called Decomposition Methods and, and, and Analytical Chemistry, and, it's, and it deals quite a bit with, uh, with, with inorganics, and that's really what one of our uh, long-term application specialists calls the, uh, the, Bible, the Bible for that. Uh, microwave manufacturers, staff, and websites, and for us that would be www.cem.com. And basically, the one other thing is, is some um, vendors have some wonderful online interactive periodic tables to give you information. And Inorganic Ventures is, uh, is the one that we point to quite often and use uh, when we're trying to figure out what will solubilize in what. So for today, the part we talked about is the inorganics. And just to conclude, the acid choice is critical. Uh, we select our acids based upon our sample matrix and the analytes of interest, and that's a, a, an interesting play, and that's something we can help you with. Uh, the one thing we have is we've been doing this for almost 40 years now, and, and CEM has the experience to assist you in getting these samples in solution. Um, you want to use the same acid, so the same acid or acids, and the same acid volume in all your vessels. So you can mix some samples a bit, but they all have to have the same acid type and acid volume in order to, uh, in order to run successfully in, in any batch system. Um, we use a one-touch method. If it's, if it's applicable, a one-touch method is, means it's a CEM-based method that we've created, and there's over 100 of them uh, in the MARS-6. And then, as we kind of showed with the molite, a stepwise approach may be required. You may have to do a two-step digestion because the one step just isn't, is, it will not take everything into solution. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of what types of inorganic samples that we work with here at CEM and then how we go about trying to put them in solution. Uh, we are available to our customers and at all times uh, to try to assist them in this. And other than that, uh, I think that concludes our portion, and I'll turn it back over. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. As we all know, it is important that you optimize your ICP sample introduction system to best suit your sample types. In our presentation today, we will cover how to handle a challenging sample matrix such as high total dissolved solids, which we'll refer to as TDS throughout the remainder of the presentation, and hydrofluoric acid, which we'll refer to as HF throughout the remainder of the presentation, and overcome the challenges associated with these sample types, which include interrupted runs, signal drift, clogged nebulizers, shortened torch life, and interferences. In an attempt to cover several different products and accessories, we will briefly introduce each one. However, these additional resources are available, which cover all the products that will be discussed today in much greater detail. We have our Nebulizer 101 Selection and Maintenance webinar, which was previously recorded and available now for on-demand viewing. We also have three application notes that are available via the URLs and also as a single handout that you can access via the GoToWebinar control panel, which Justin alerted to us earlier today. As I just mentioned, nebulizer selection was previously covered in great detail within our Nebulizer 101 webinar. In this particular presentation, we will focus on two of our most popular high TDS nebulizer options. The Sea Spray Nebulizer is one of the best choices when samples containing high concentrations of dissolved solids are being analyzed. The unique polished tip of the sea spray provides a self-washing design, offering freedom from clogging while nebulizing solutions upwards of 20% TDS. 
while at the same time providing excellent transport efficiency for trace level analysis. The C spray is the standard configuration for many ICP OES instruments due to its well rounded overall performance. We also offer a low uptake C spray model for higher matrix ICPMS applications. The Duramis concentric nebulizer is made from Peak. It is the most economical inert nebulizer for high precision analysis. It is highly sensitive with excellent short term precision and the highest tolerance to dissolve solids of any concentric nebulizer. It's a great all-arounder and ideal for high throughput labs that require a good balance between durability and sensitivity. Serviceability is also high as the capillary insert assembly can be replaced if needed. It is standard operation to use dry argon as your ICP nebulizer gas in order to generate an aerosol and transport the sample to the plasma. However, when dealing with samples containing high amounts of TDS, you have an increased likelihood of salt deposits forming at the tip of the nebulizer and injector. This can result in a failed analysis due to a drift in signal or, in worst case, an extinguished plasma. It also results in frequent nebulizer maintenance and a higher rate of nebulizer replacement. For optimum performance, you can humidify the nebulizer gas before it comes in contact with the sample, decreasing the likelihood of salt deposits forming at the tip of the nebulizer and injector. Adding an argon humidifier will reduce maintenance and the chance of an extinguished plasma due to a blocked nebulizer or injector. Glass Expansion designed the Allegra argon humidifier to provide an efficient yet simple to use humidifier for both ICP OES and ICP MS applications. For easy installation on any instrument and with any nebulizer, each of our Allegra kits is packaged with customized gas connectors. The Allegra is a compact design, roughly the size of a soda can. There's no heating or electric power required, and it's completely metal free and uses a non-pressurized water reservoir. As we discussed earlier, it is essential that you choose a nebulizer capable of handling a high amount of TDS, if that is your sample matrix. Here is data collected using a nebulizer not recommended for high TDS work. Under a stress test of continuously aspirating a 25% sodium chloride solution with no rinsing, with no humidification, the nebulizer is completely clogged in a few minutes. In comparison to with the humidifier on, this particular nebulizer could aspirate continuously for almost over 30 minutes. Although analyzing solutions with such high levels of dissolved solids is generally not recommended, this is a great example of how the Allegra can improve the nebulizer's performance. Even when a high TDS nebulizer is cho chosen, some matrices like lithium metaboric fusions can pose a challenge due to the very high amount of TDS. To test the Allegra in a real world application, we sent it to a contract testing lab who was struggling with drift, interrupted analysis, and frequent nebulizer maintenance. With the Allegra, runs are now stable and nebulizer maintenance's frequency is greatly reduced. We will hear from Stan Smith of Perkin Elmer a little later today, who will go into greater detail about the challenges associated with these particular fusion samples. Next up is spray chamber selection. Glass Expansion offers a wide variety of spray chambers to accommodate all kinds of samples, just like our nebulizer product line. Here, we will briefly highlight the design advantages of Glass Expansion's cyclonic spray chambers. Spray chamber selection and maintenance will be covered in much more detail within our August 26th webinar. Today, we will feature our twister design in both a glass and PTFE, as this is the preferred design for high matrix applications. Both the design and manufacture of cyclonic spray chambers are critical to the performance of your ICP. An indented groove is built into the top of the glass expansion spray chamber and serves as a barrier preventing solution from being swept up into the torch. The position and depth of this groove are critical. Note the walls of the spray chamber have a vertical region. This is important for proper aerosol generation and affects transport efficiency to the torch. 
The knockout tube, or baffle, is cut at an angle and carefully positioned to maximize transport of the aerosol but minimize the transport of large droplets. Our Helix CT fitting is carefully designed to fix the depth of penetration and the torque of the nebulizer seal so that the aerosol produced is optimum. All glass expansion spray chambers also include a Unifit connector and capillary for smooth, efficient draining. The new Helix CT locking screw features a built-in torque control mechanism, which allows for a consistent seal of the PTFE ferrule against the nebulizer, making it impossible to over-tighten or under-tighten while ensuring a gas-tight seal each and every time. Also, there's no need to worry about changing O-rings or nebulizers getting bonded to O-rings. The Helix CT interface is the standard option now with all glass expansion spray chamber designs. For ICP sample digestions that require hydrofluoric acid, or if the final sample concentration contains trace amounts of HF, a glass or quartz ICP sample introduction system is going to be unsuitable. For these types of ICP analyses, an inert sample introduction system consisting of a spray chamber and a nebulizer made from various plastic materials is recommended. A common problem with inert spray chambers is that the polymer materials do not wet completely and large droplets will collect on the inside walls. The formation and collection of droplets degrades ICP performance, leading to erratic drainage, poor precision, and poor signal stability. A major breakthrough in the performance of inert spray chambers came with glass expansion's introduction of a proprietary steady flow tr surface treatment in 2006. The steady flow treatment improves the wettability of the surface, ensuring efficient drainage and delivering sensitivity and precision that's comparable to those achieved with a glass or quartz spray chamber. Sandblasting of the plastic or polymer is another common surface treatment technique used to improve performance. However, that improvement still only provides about 50% of the sensitivity of a glass spray chamber, whereas the sensitivity of the stead flow treated PTF spray chamber is nearly equivalent to the glass spray chamber as shown in the diagram here. Now the decision on spray chamber comes down to two different designs. The twister cyclonic spray chamber features a central transfer tube, often referred to as a baffle or double pass cyclonic. This feature provides a smaller particle size and more narrow uh, size distribution compared to the single pass cyclonic or Tracy spray chamber. Smaller droplet sizes reduce matrix effects and improve short-term precision, making the twister the most suitable choice for high matrix samples and the PTFE twister for high matrix samples containing HF. The reduced sample load helps to increase torch life, slow salt buildup at the injector tip, and decrease the frequency of cleaning ICPMS interface cones. Now that we've covered nebulizer and spray chamber selection, this leaves us with the ICP torch. The combination of high temperature and salt deposits causes a quartz torch outer tube to devitrify. The disadvantage of a single piece torch is that it is a relatively high cost consumable item that requires regular maintenance and replacement, particularly with more demanding samples such as high TDS. This is because the whole torch must be replaced when just the outer tube suffers from the devitrification. The glass expansion patented D-torch is an economical alternative to the single piece and other semi-demountable torch options. The D-Torch, often referred to as our super torch by our customers, incorporates a ceramic intermediate tube for greater robustness and provides the analyst with an outer tube that can be replaced when it fails rather than replacing the entire torch. The D-Torch also features an interchangeable injector, allowing the analyst to install a specific injector, material, or internal diameter for each application, whether it be for aqueous, organics, high TDS, or HF. Also important is the O-ring free design. 
The detour is available for several different model ICPs, and you can check the availability for your own ICP at www.geicp.com slash detorch. Also unique to the detorch is the optional ceramic outer tube, which is of particular benefit for the analysis of high TDS sample matrices because the Cylon material does not devitrify like quartz. Using a ceramic outer tube on your ICP produces a hotter, more robust plasma, which also reduces matrix effects and improves your detection limits. Compared to a quartz outer tube, the ceramic outer tube has a much longer lifetime, greatly reducing maintenance, cleaning, and dowd time due to torch failure. In some sample matrices, quartz outer tubes can degrade in hours, while the ceramic outer tube will last years under the same conditions. As an example, we compared a quartz outer tube with a ceramic outer tube, both of which were exposed to six hours of a 10% sodium chloride analysis. You can clearly see that there is no change to the integrity of the ceramic outer, whereas the quartz is severely devitrified. The ceramic outer tube is especially ideal for fusion samples, where the lithium salts rapidly attack quartz. Now that we have introduced each sample introduction option for high matrix applications, we will now organize these products into application kits and present some data. We'll hear from Stan Smith following this presentation where the Avio 500 is used in combination with the Glass Expansion C-Spray Nebulizer, Twister Spray Chamber, Allegra Argon Humidifier, and our fully ceramic D-Torch. The details of this work can also be found in Perkin Elmer Application Note 35847 which is also available to you as a handout with today's webinar. I will be highlighting the performance of Glass Expansion's PTFE Twister Cyclonic Spray Chamber, Duramus Nebulizer, and Fully Ceramic Detorch as our HF resistant application kit for high matrix samples. In this study, the Glass Expansion sample instruction system was compared to a cross-flow nebulizer paired with a polyphenyl sulfide which I'll refer to as PPS, Scott type spray chamber, and a non concentric polymeric nebulizer referred to as NCPN throughout the remainder of the presentation, which was also paired with a PPS Scott type spray chamber. A Perkin Elmer Avio 200 sequential ICP OAS was used for this work. Their experimental conditions are listed in the table provided. Without relying on the auto integration feature, integration times were manually set to two seconds for each analyte wavelength in order to maintain consistency for all sample introduction systems tested. A multi-element test solution containing 0.5 ppm copper and manganese and a 1 ppm arsenic, selenium, manganese, sodium, and potassium was used. Each sample introduction system was evaluated based on measured sensitivity, signal to root background ratio, referred to as SRBR, and precision. For the sensitive, sensitivity and SRBR calculations, net signal counts per ppm was used. Precision of the net signals was estimated by analyzing the multi-element test solution. The first parameter that we examine is sensitivity obtained with the NCPN paired with the PPS Scott type and crossflow paired with the Scott type relative to the sensitivity of the Duramist nebulizer paired with the PTFE twister spray chamber. The results show that the combination of the Duramist and PTFE twister provides an increase in sensitivity by more than 50% or more for all elements examined. As mentioned previously, the best indicator of analytical detectability for ICP OES using a solid state detector is the signal to root background ratio. Similar to what was observed when comparing sensitivity, the Duramist nebulizer and PTFE twister spray chamber provided close to a 50% improvement in the signal to root background ratio when compared to the other two inert sample introduction systems. The final merit of performance examined was short-term analytical precision. The precision results also indicate 
that the Duramus Nebulizer and PTFE Twister provide superior RSDs, well below 1%. So in summary, for those laboratories that require the utmost in sensitivity and precision in an inert sample introduction kit, the combination of the Duramus and PTFE Twister and fully ceramic D-Torch is the optimal choice for HF and high matrix samples. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Ryan. And now we'll hear from Stan Smith of Perkin Elmer. Good afternoon and good morning for those of you out west. As Justin indicated, my name is Stan Smith and I'm the manager for the inorganic field application scientists at Perkin Elmer, but I'm still an application scientist at heart. I'd like to take a few minutes today to review some work I did with a customer on some very challenging fusion samples. We'll briefly go over what makes fusion samples so challenging, what we did to overcome these challenges, and show you some data to demonstrate how well the solutions worked. Then we'll wrap it up with a summary and review the hardware components and the application note. Fusion fluxes are a common approach to preparing geological samples, such as rocks and ore samples. There are a variety of flux materials, including peroxides, persulfates, and meta or tetraborates. In this work, the customer had developed a lithium metaborate flux matrix. Essentially, the crushed ore sample is added to lithium metaborate in a platinum crucible and heated over a flame or in a furnace to melt the salt and dissolve the ore. The molten flux is then cooled back to a solid, which can then be dissolved in dilute acid. The specific ingredients in this fusion flux vary with sample type, as do the dissolution acids used. These fusion samples are particularly challenging for ICP analysis. Depending on the flux material or blend thereof, they contain very high concentrations of lithium, sodium, and potassium. These salts deposit on the torch, injector, and nebulizer, which eventually leads to signal drift due to aerosol transport changes. More often than not, the deposits result in a reduced signal leading to failed quality control samples, which requires corrective actions such as sample intro cleaning and recalibration, which takes time away from sample analysis. In addition, this high salt matrix causes the rapid devitrification of the quartz torch. Devitrification is a process where the quartz structure actually starts to break down. At first, it appears as a whitish frost on the quartz and eventually degrades the quartz to the point where it erodes away and pieces of quartz may fall off. There are three things that contribute to quartz devitrification, high temperatures, oxidizers, and group one elements such as lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. In an argon plasma, the high temp is a given, but the argon gas flows help protect the quartz from the direct contact. However, the lithium and other salts in the fusion matrix wreak havoc on the quartz. Torches may last only weeks or days, depending on the conditions. These factors make it very challenging to achieve long-term stability. For the customer that I was working with, they run a 24-7 operation, and the ICP instruments are never turned off unless necessary. For them, long-term stability was essential, as well as reduced downtime. Specific to this work, the ore samples subjected to the fusion preparation were mineral ore samples, largely iron ore, with high levels of silica, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, and manganese. The fusion flux was dissolved and brought up to volume in 5% nitric acid prior to analysis. The ICP was calibrated using matrix matched in-house standards. That is, large batches of ore samples were analyzed repeatedly and corroborated against reference materials and external analytical techniques. These calibration standards are prepared with each batch of ore samples. Yttrium is used as an internal standard to compensate for any minor differences that matrix matching doesn't already address, such as sample transport fluctuations. Because all samples and standards are prepared with the same dilution factor, the yttrium is included right in the diluent and minimizes any delivery errors. Routine sample introduction hardware and plasma conditions are not particularly effective for fusion samples, especially for long-term stability. Typical hardware and plasma conditions are intended for more routine aqueous samples that don't have such high solids content, particularly the alkali elements. The goal here was to find alternative hardware that could better handle this matrix and to limit the aerosol being transported to plasma to minimize deposits. Glass Expansion was kind enough to work with us to come up with a high solid sample intro kit that could be used for fusion samples. This kit consisted of the following components. The C-spray nebulizer is designed to be a very efficient nebulizer, yielding great sensitivity, 
yet resists the clogging and deposits of many concentric style nebulizers. The Allegra argon humidifier takes the argon and passes it through a permeable membrane submerged in water to moisten the argon. The humidified argon prevents crystals or deposits from forming at the nebulizer tip by dissolving them. This also impacts the injector as well, reducing deposit formation. I would never consider running high solid samples such as fusion, fracking water, or brines without an argon humidifier. After 48 hours of continuous analysis of fusion samples, the back pressure on the sea spray had not changed, indicating that no deposits were forming on the nebulizer tip to block it. The twister spray chamber is a glass baffled cyclonic spray chamber. The baffle helps to knock down the larger aerosol particles and only allows a more uniform, finer aerosol into the plasma. This helps form a more robust and stable plasma. The overall intensity may be reduced with the baffled spray chamber, but the precision is improved with a more uniform aerosol and provides much better stability with high matrix samples. As mentioned earlier, the high solve content, notably lithium, results in dramatically increased quartz devitrification and reduced torch life. The D-Torch is a ceramic torch that replaces the quartz torch altogether, both inner and outer tubes. The ceramic material stands up to the high salts far better than quartz, and its typical lifetime is measured in years, not weeks. As a side note, since the outer tube is also ceramic and opaque, you won't be able to see the plasma. The D-Torch also has a quartz outer tube that can be used for method development and optimizing plasma conditions. Once those conditions are determined, simply replace the quartz outer tube with a ceramic one. In addition, I had previously performed a quick sensitivity check and noticed no difference at all between the default quartz torch and the D-Torch. The routine two millimeter injector was replaced with a 1.2 millimeter alumina injector. The smaller bore injector helped to reduce the overall aerosol reaching the plasma and produced a much more robust plasma with a well-defined lithium bullet in the central channel of the plasma. Where greater sensitivity is needed, such as with fracking waters, a 1.6 millimeter injector has also found to work well. The next three parameters in this table are typical for high solid samples. We want high power to help break down the matrix. We use a high negative value for the torch position to create a gap between the injector tip and the base of the plasma to minimize deposits on the injector tip. The sample uptake rate can be reduced from typical flow rates for cleaner aqueous samples to minimize plasma load and to help create a more robust plasma. The read time for the target elements can be adjusted as needed. In this work, the concentrations were not extremely low level, so long integration and read times were not necessary. This table shows the analytical wavelengths that were used for the five target elements and the internal standard. For the customer ore samples being analyzed, these wavelengths were free of spectral interferences and provided more than adequate sensitivity. As previously noted, the sample concentrations for the target elements were not extremely low and in such cases, radial view mode is preferred. Radial view is generally free of actors that can sometimes influence axial view, such as ionization effects, matrix effects, and spectral interferences. If you don't need the sensitivity of axial view mode, we recommend radial view. Plasma conditions should ideally be optimized for the samples being analyzed and for the sample introduction hardware being used. With less complex aqueous samples, we can often provide a fixed set of conditions for the default sample intro hardware that will work adequately. With heavy complex matrices full of salts and dissolved solids, however, we really need to optimize the plasma conditions for that matrix. In particular, optimizing the plasma flow, auxiliary flow, nebulizer gas flow, and torch position are important for establishing a robust plasma that is capable of long-term stability with these complex matrices. The plasma on the left was what was in place when I arrived at the customer site and there were complaints of rapid deposit formation and signal drift. With this plasma, the lithium bullet was too short and broad and was not forming a good central channel for the aerosol to be introduced into the plasma. As a consequence, some of the sample aerosol was being entrained or working its way to the outside of the plasma and up the inner wall of the torch leading to increased torch vitrification and loss of signal intensity. Also, the base of the plasma was very close to the injector tip, which allowed the salts to deposit on the injector tip, causing signal drift. Following some adjustments and optimizations, we were able to establish the plasma you see on the right. If you compare the plasma on the right to the one on the left, you can see that the lithium bullet is much better defined and extends to the second plate. 
there's also a much better defined invisible gap between the base of the plasma and the injector tip. You'll also notice that there is no entrainment of the lithium aerosol around the base of the plasma or running up the sides of the torch. These are all important factors in obtaining long-term stability and for minimizing maintenance. So now we'll take a look at the results obtained using the high solid sample intro kit and proper plasma optimization. After setting up the high solid sample intro kit and optimizing the plasma conditions, we set up a long-term run to simulate the customer's 24 seven operation. The run sequence started with the calibration using their in-house standards, followed by a repeated cycle of two quality control samples and a batch of ore samples with an acid matrix matched rinse between samples. The run effectively ended 12 and a half hours later when one of the QC sample vials was exhausted. Had the third shift staff been able to top off the bottles, the run would have gone on even longer. In this plot, we show the stability of the yttrium internal standard. The initial point is established as 100% recovery in the calibration blank. Throughout the more than 12 hours of analysis of the fusion samples, the recovery of the internal standard never deviated by more than 5% and more than 92% of the readings were within 2%. As was previously mentioned, the customer analyzes two in-house quality control samples with each batch of ore samples to determine bias and precision. This plot shows the results obtained for the first QC sample that was analyzed repeatedly between the batch of ore samples. The QC samples were analyzed approximately every 18 minutes. Here we can see that all the recoveries were within 2% of the known values, and the relative standard deviation of the three replicates was less than 1%. This plot shows the recoveries and RSDs for the second QC sample. With the exception of aluminum, again, all the recoveries were within 2% of the known values and the RSDs were less than 1%. The customer had been having difficulties with this batch of QC ore and believed it to be contaminated with aluminum. Despite the contamination, the recoveries did not deviate by more than 2% from the average of 110%, and the RSDs were also less than 1%. Following two full days of nonstop analysis of fusion samples, we took the torch and injector out to inspect for deposits. The outer ceramic tube had some minor salt deposition, but nothing that had any impact on data quality or stability. The lip of the inner auxiliary ceramic tube had only trace amounts of salt deposits. Again, nothing that impacted data quality or stability. What was most impressive was that there were no deposits at all on the injector. Previously, the customer would perform hot swaps of injectors when the signal started to drift significantly, which was their sign that deposits were affecting the signal. They had never seen an injector this clean after 48 hours. Also, as was previously mentioned, the nebulizer gas back pressure had not changed, nor had the signal intensity indicating that there were no deposits forming on the nebulizer tip. In addition to the high solid sample intro components that minimize salt deposits, the Avio 500 uses plasma shear, which also helps to minimize deposits. The primary function of plasma shear is to cut off the cool and noisy tail plume of the plasma. In radial view, this would not be necessary, but since the Avio 500 is a dual view instrument, removing this tail plume is necessary for axial view. It eliminates interferences from the cool zone of the plasma where molecular emission is greatest as well as plasma flicker. It also prevents the plasma from damaging the axial optics window. With high solid samples, an added benefit is that the plasma shear prevents deposition on the axial optics window and prevents any particles from falling down into the plasma. While axial view was not used in this work, this feature would be very beneficial where more sensitivity is needed, such as with fracking water samples. To conclude, I believe this work and presentation have shown you that the Avio 500 with a glass expansion high solid sample intro kit provides accurate, precise, and reproducible results with challenging high salt samples like ore fusion samples. Additionally, this quality can be achieved for long periods of time demonstrating excellent stability. There are many other features of the Avio 500 that contribute to the stability and performance, but we'll save that for another presentation. For the purpose of this presentation, I focused on those features and hardware that uniquely impact quality and stability in the high solid samples. I'd also like to point out that this work was performed at the customer site using their Avio 500 and all their reagents and standards. I was simply there to help train them on their new Avio and to introduce them to the new high solid sample intro kit. To review, that kit includes the Allegra Argon humidifier, the Sea Spray High Solids Nebulizer, 
the twister baffled cyclonic spray chamber, a narrow bore alumina injector, and the ceramic detorch. And let's not forget the Avios plasma shear. More details of this work can be found in the application note on the Perkin Lumber website. And this app note is also included as a handout to this webinar. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day today to spend some time with us, and I hope you found the presentations informative. With that, I'd like to pass the controls back over to Justin. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and now we have a few minutes where we can go to our questions and answers segment. Uh, just a reminder, you can ask questions uh, at any point. You can still ask them, just uh, put them in the chat window and we'll do our best to answer. Also, if there are any uh, highly technical questions, uh, typically what we'll do is we'll, we'll give you a, a brief answer um, over the live webinar. And then once the question and answer document is updated and made available, uh, we'll include much, much more information uh, than we can include um, here in that document. So first question we have for Bob. Uh, Bob, I'm going to ask two questions together. Uh, we have an alloy that has hafnium and cerium. Do you have any rec recommendations on type of acids required? Uh, also from the same asker, uh, we have an alloy that has gold and silver. Do you have any recommendations for types of acids required? Okay, I've got both of those. Appreciate that. Um, I probably have a little more information on the gold and silver because that's pretty common. And we have experience working here with both gold and silver. And the problem that we run into, and I'm sure you have too out there in the, in the audience, is that the aqua regia is really needed to put the gold in solution, but then you have the HCl that can complex to form silver chloride. And you can see that forming on the sides of your liner inside. Um, if you were to analyze immediately, and that's one thing, if you were to digest and then get that over the analyzer within 30 minutes, and your silver was in a lower range, maybe in the PPB range, um, then it's quite possible you could do them together. Uh, but if they're in higher concentrations, it's going to be two separate digestions, which is not the answer anybody looks for, but it's usually the case. Also, real quick, if you have used some vessel liners and have used hydrochloric acid in them in the past, you need to be careful because the residual chloride can be present and it will again form the silver chloride and now you get lower silver results. What we do is we take our liners and we put them in an air oven at 150 degrees and we call it a bake out and we bake them for four hours and that will get rid of the residual chloride gas. We have a video on the website that shows how to do that. Hafnium and cerium, I don't have as much uh, experience with. I'm gonna talk with one, a couple more of our applications chemists and that again, we'll give a more detailed one. But we do know some work we've done with hafnium in the past, we know that's gonna be an HF application. Um, so I would anticipate that it's gonna be, when we get the final answer, that basically you're gonna see some form of combination of nitric and HF, and there might even be some water in there. But um, we, like I said, we'll give you a much better uh, fuller answer when uh, when we when we post them back to you, so to speak. But uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. Thanks. Okay, uh, Stan. Question for you: Can you describe what a good salt bullet looks like on an Optima seventy three hundred dual view? So on the Optima series, that was back to a traditional uh, helical coil. I believe three turns on the coil. So typically on your sodium bullet, yttrium bullet. Um, whatever you want to use to create the bullet, lithium in the case of the borates, um, you want that bullet right about at the third coil. Um, so maybe just poking out past the coil. On the flat plate designs on the Optima 8000 series and the Avios, you want that bullet right about maybe just shy of that second plate. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Ryan, question for you. I assume that there is an increased cost associated with the D-Torch. When would it make sense for a lab to, to switch over to the D-Torch platform as opposed to continuing to use a single piece torch? Okay, so with a single piece torch, typically the D-Torch pays for itself after you've replaced two outer tubes. If, if you're going through torch replacement on uh, maybe like a a monthly basis, that's where you really want to take a look at investing in the ceramic outer tube uh, to to get your ROI. Uh, the ceramic outer tube will be a much better choice if you're going through a much higher rate of, of torch replacement costs. And that's typically going to be very common, uh, as both Stan and I 
mentioned in our talks when you're doing these really high matrix uh, sample matrices like the like the fusion samples are really high TDS um, or high, even high, very high concentrations of acids as well. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, we have a couple more questions for Bob. Uh, Bob, do some elements sublime off during digestion? There is usually low yield for elements like phosphorus, sulfur, and silicon while using microwave digesters. Any idea why? Okay, that's a that's a really good question. And the answer is the silicon, you know, something that sublimes basically goes directly from the solid to the gas state and then comes back as a solid. And certainly silicon will do that. It's a silicon tetrafluoride, and you can see it coating uh, on the on the inside of the vessel. Uh, so that basically, you have to make sure you get you get out at the end. So that makes silicon uh, analysis difficult. I'm going to check with our uh, senior team uh, afterwards, and again, we'll go more fuller um, in, uh, form answer, so to speak, um, with the written part. But as far as phosphorus and sulfur, I'm going to be able to give you a much better answer because we just finished a study yesterday where we did uh, sulfur and, and phosphorus in the um, uh, in, in an analyzed for it in geological samples. And uh, phosphorus and sulfur are difficult both when you do the digest, keeping them in, and then also analysis side. So I'll be able to answer a little bit on saying, hey, here's how we did the digest, here's what we did to take care, and here's how we set up the analyzer uh, also in order to get good um, to get the good numbers. And uh, we did get, I, I was in a meeting this morning, the numbers for sulfur and phosphorus did come out very good. So uh, I think we can help you definitely there. But the silicon has an issue, and then boron would also be one of those things. Boron for, uh, forms boron trifluoride, and became difficult to analyze for boron. So hopefully, again, that, that gives you an idea, and a, and a better answer will be coming. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Ryan, question for you and Stan. You, you might want to chime in uh, if you have anything to add. For a regular water sample mixed with high sodium once in a while, what's a preferred nebulizer spray chamber combination you recommend? Uh, I'm using an Optimus 7300 dB. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I mean, so the the problem is is that probably for your your regular water samples, maybe you don't necessarily need a high TDS nebulizer. But if you're going even infrequently, you're going to be running high samples that have a higher amount of total dissolved solid or a higher amount of the sodium in them, you're going to need that that high TDS nebulizer. And if you wanna save your torch and create a bit more robust plasma condition to, to be able to handle the higher matrix samples better, you really want to, to settle on something like the, the C-spray nebulizer and twister spray chamber combination. And you know, don't be afraid to add a simple accessory like the argon humidifier, even for your regular water samples. I mean, we've had a lot of customers who even though they're running uh, lower amounts of TDS in their samples, the argon humidifier is not gonna degrade the performance by any means. If anything, it's just gonna help your nebulizer and injector uh, run cleaner for longer periods of time. So it will it'll reduce the frequency at which you have to take those components out to clean them and also re reduce the frequency at which you're replacing them. The other important thing to note about the C spray nebulizer is that I briefly highlighted this, but it's also a great all around nebulizer that's very good for trace analysis because it's it's a very efficient nebulizer. And Stan mentioned that briefly in his talk as well. And that's why the C spray can be found uh, as a standard configuration on a lot of different ICP models due to its versatility of being really excellent uh, for applications that require very efficient high sensitivity nebulizer, but also for applications that require uh, something that can tolerate a, a higher amount of, of total dissolved solids. And with regards to choosing between say a, a baffled and a, a non-baffled cyclonic spray chamber, the the difference in, in sensitivity or count that you, you're gonna get is sometimes negligible. If you compare the two typically it's about a difference of 10 to 15 percent between our tracy and twister but the benefits that you get from the twister are you're going to create that more narrow droplet size distribution so you're going to see much uh, better precision um, and you're also going to as i mentioned create 
like a more robust uh, plasma condition. So you're able to handle the, the higher matrix and reduce those chances of, of interferences. And then I'll, I'll let Stan chime in if he wants to specifically mention something uh, about the Optima 7300 as well. Sure, so Ryan hit on a lot of good points. Um, a lot of it ultimately comes up or comes down to the amount of maintenance you're willing to tolerate. If you don't mind taking the nebulizer out and cleaning it on a more regular basis, you could stick with whatever you currently have. Um, just personally, I, I agree with Ryan, the Sea Spray is a great all around nebulizer. It'll have similar performance to what you may have by default on an Optima uh, and add the ability to add um, higher solids. One thing you can do to just monitor if your nebulizer is starting to show blockage is to monitor the back pressure. In the software that you have on the Optima, there is the ability to monitor back pressure. It'll show up on screen with each individual reading. And if you're watching the back pressure start to increase as you run those high salt samples, then you know the nebulizer is being impacted in its performance. And you probably do want to consider a higher solids nebulizer. And as Ryan also mentioned, um, the Allegra, we have many customers using the Allegra on routine, say, environmental applications. It won't hurt anything. And even in what we call clean water samples, our drinking water can often be very hard water. So while it's clean, it's still got significant total dissolved solids in it, particularly calcium, magnesium. And the humidifier can help a great deal with that sort of stability. One thing that I really, really like about uh, what Stan had mentioned is, is the monitoring of the nebulizer back pressure. That's something that we covered in our maintenance webinar. And that's one key thing to note and check on a daily basis is to when you're running optimally, what that back pressure is. And then as it starts to deviate from that optimum, you'll know that if there might be some nebulizer maintenance required or to check connection for you know leaks or improper fittings if the back pressure starts to dip below what that norm is. All right, let's do one more question. And Ryan, this will be for you since it's a follow-up question to what was just discussed, uh, although I believe you did briefly mention some of this. Do the configurations you're recommending have any impact on detection limits? None whatsoever, and in fact, you know, we kind of highlighted a little bit using a, a baffled cyclonic spray chamber can improve your detection limits because you're getting a, an improvement in your signal to noise ratio uh, because you're creating that more narrow droplet size distribution. So the droplets that are being introduced into the plasma are much, much finer and you're creating a more robust plasma that can really help with the detection limits. And in some of our application notes, you'll see a a comparison of, uh, say, the, the D-Torch with a quartz outer tube compared to the D-Torch with a ceramic outer tube. Um, and I think Stan briefly mentioned this in, in his talk as well, is that there's no degradation in the performance when choosing to use a quartz torch versus the ceramic outer tube. In fact, in some cases in our own R&D lab, we've seen that the ceramic outer tube can actually create a, a hotter plasma creating or improving detection limits for certain wavelengths for elements of interest. All right, thanks. And that's about all we have for time today. Uh, just a reminder, if we didn't answer the question you asked or if we didn't provide enough detail, uh, those questions will be answered and updated in the follow-up documentation. So thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Bob, Ryan, and Stan uh, for your help presenting. And we hope you can join us next time.